Namaste, a very heartfelt welcome to the Shravan Mahashiv, to the Shravan Shivratri. And this is a very special satsang with Sri Anish today, a very auspicious day. I was just thinking that uh, ever since this series has started, a lot of satsangs have happened on very profound days, very, very auspicious days. So we are all blessed to receive the Guru's guidance, the Guru's words on such days when the uh, existence is also supporting us to receive the grace and receive his words and receive his guidance. Uh, Shravan, for those of you who do not know, is the month which comes when the monsoon starts. Uh, it's the first month when the monsoon begins and it is dedicated to Lord Shiva. Anishji will share more about it. And uh, today is also new moon, which is Amavasya. And new moon is also called Shivratri, again dedicated to Lord Shiva. So Lord Shiva's blessing is pouring on us today and we are very blessed that we are starting this day with the satsang. Uh, so please make yourself comfortable and completely available here to receive the grace and guidance of the Guru. There is something special I'm going to show you uh, in the message of uh, this particular seed in this particular episode you must have noted we shared that Sri Anish will be joining us from Spiti. So Spiti is high up in the Himalayas. So we are on a pilgrimage. Some of the Sangha members have also uh, been blessed to, to get the opportunity to join him on this pilgrimage. So I'm sitting outside and I thought, let me give you a quick view of where we are. Okay, so can you see those? So the dry, uh, they look dry, but they're like desert, majestic mountains of the Spiti. And uh, if you have visited the Dharamshala ashram, then the mountains there are very different. But these are very different. As I have come here for the first time. And uh, every morning I wake up and I'm, I always pay my gratitude and always spell bound. So I thought, why not share with all of you also so that you too become a part of this journey. So without taking much time now, I think it's now time to invite uh, Sri Anish. I'll request him to please join us. Namaste. Namaste, everybody. And a very warm welcome to all of you on this uh, special satsang today. Yes, so happy to see you all. Namaste. Namaste, Sri Nishi. It's a very special day today when we are having this satsang. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So did, did you share where we are uh, at this moment, Swati? Yes, Nishi. I shared a glimpse of the mountains. <laughs> I showed them. Okay. So before we uh, begin today's uh, question answers, uh, few things I thought I'll share with you, uh, both on where we are and also on the significance of this this day today, 4th of August. What is the significance of this in this season? So as, as you know, we are in the middle of the monsoon season in India. The season we call Chaturmas, a four-month period. This four month period is dedicated to inner sadhana. This is a period where we don't venture out, but we venture in. This is a period of solitude. This is a period of silence. This is a period of spending time with one's own self. So that after this period, we are very clear. What is it that this life means to us? What is it that we must do in this life? What is our real calling in this life and after this period of chaturmas four months we actually enter into a new phase where we start to craft a new divine life that we are here for so as the mythology goes you know india is land of mythology so as the mythology goes during these four months as you know we have the concept of trinity here Brahma, the creator of the existence. 
Bhagwan Vishnu, who is the sustainer, and Shiva in the Trinity concept. We consider Shiva as the annihilator, where everything gets absorbed into the Shiva and a new world later on gets created. So Bhagwan Vishnu, who is the who is the sustainer of this entire world, entire cosmos. During this period of Chaturmas, four months of monsoon in India, we believe that Bhagwan Vishnu goes into his deep yoga nidra, which is yogic sleep, to, to rest and to also re uh, nurture himself so that he's able to take care of the world in a better way. And during this period of Chaturmas, before he goes into the cosmic yogic sleep, he hands over the reins of managing the world to Shiva. Now, as we know, <coughs> Shiva does not live on earth. But why this period is very important for all Shiva devotees across the globe? Because when Bhagwan Vishnu gives the reign of the world to Shiva, he requests Shiva to please come on earth and take care of the beings here. So during this period of four months, Shiva actually comes down on earth, stays on earth for these four months to take care of his devotees, of all the beings of the earth, and to make sure that the world runs smoothly. So we believe as Shiva devotees, as Shiva lovers, we believe that during these four months, it becomes extremely easy to access Shiva because he's on earth to connect with him, to talk to him, to invoke him. So this is a golden opportunity. These four months is a golden opportunity. And then this day today, which is Shravan Amavasya, you know, the dark nights are very favorite of Shiva. The Amavasya, which we call the new moon, is favorite of Shiva because every Amavasya is very silent, the energy is very silent, the energy is very still. The entire cosmic energy is actually pushing us to go deep into meditation. And today's Amavasya, today's dark night is very special because it is falling in this, is the first Amavasya of the Chaturmas season. <coughs> so we call it Shravan Shivaratri, a night dedicated to Shiva, especially when he himself is available on earth for all his devotees. So it's a very profound day for all of us to connect and pray and receive abundant blessings of Shiva. And uh, it's such a coincidence that when this date came to me, that the next session is on 4th of August, I did not realize it then. But later on, when I looked at the calendar deeply, I realized, oh, today is a very special day. So somehow, I think nature and Shiva, they, they support this entire process. They make sure that such gatherings happen on these profound days so that your receptivity is high, your channels are open. Whatever you want to receive, you will be able to receive during this day, this satsang. And uh, about a week, 10 days ago, we decided to take this journey from Dharamshala to the higher Himalayas. So where we are today, um, we're sitting at about 13,000 feet altitude. The oxygen is little low. So if we run, we, we, we have to breathe heavily because thin <clears throat> the air is very thin this is called a high altitude desert there is no vegetation here why we chose to come here during chaturmas this entire region the high desert area of the himalayas which is above 10000 feet so from last 10 days we've been dwelling in above 10000 feet altitude and today we are at about 13000 feet altitude this entire region since thousands of years has been a favorite of the yogis from different traditions 
the Shiva yogis, yogis from the Buddhist tradition, it has been favorite because the silence and the stillness here is unimaginable. There's just no people, very few people. If you travel on these roads, seldom you will see another vehicle. So you are back of beyond of everything. So this place, these higher reaches are very conducive for meditative journeys. In fact, I'm just told yesterday that uh, last year they found a, a yogic grave here on, on these mountains, which is dated about 3,500 years ago, which means even the even before the Buddhist era, Buddhist era started about 2,500 years ago. Even before the Buddhist era, there was there were yogis living here. There were yogis doing their sadhanas here. And I have found a lot of signals externally and inwardly that this entire land belongs to Shiva. This entire region belongs to Shiva yogis. I've also got signals which tells me that even Buddha, because now these lands are being inhabited by uh, people who follow Buddha, I believe that even Buddha himself was a worshipper, a devotee of Shiva. Probably Buddha also learned a lot of his yogic processes, meditation processes from the Shiva lineage. And that is the reason. Even 1000 years before Buddha was born, there were yogis here. And then when Buddha happened in India, his key disciples, he sent them to this region to spread the Dharma. And now you, you meet a lot of Buddhist Lamas here. The region is full of Buddhist Lamas and monasteries. So that's where we are. I thought we'll just set the context, give you a flavor of this day and where we are. We're all blessed to be here. Um, and we're also uh, protected by Shiva because as we entered into the valley, we heard that a uh, lot of uh, monsoon related calamities and disasters happened on the same route. Uh, but Shiva has been kind, a uh, great protector. He made sure that we reach here safely and we do what we are here for. So with that, uh, I request Swati ji to uh, initiate today's, today's satsang. Yes. Thank you, Nishri. I'll start with the question. The first question is from Deepa. She's from New Delhi. She's asking how to be in meditative mode 24 by 7 while performing day-to-day -day life job. Wonderful. Brilliant question, Deepa. How to be meditative 24 by 7? Before that, we need to understand what meditation is all about. Because I see, I meet people, everybody has a different connotation, different understanding of what meditation is all about. <clears throat> For many people, it's about sitting with closed eyes, focusing their thought, their energies, their attention on an image, on a bindu, on a point, on an imaginative thing, to see colors, to see visions and all of that. For some, so for different people, meditation has different meaning. Let's today understand what do we mean by meditation at the very basic level. What is meditation? And then when, then we'll come to how do we maintain it 24 by 7. Meditation is nothing but developing a deep presence. In every moment, developing a deep presence. What does it mean? Deep presence means that if I'm here talking to you right now, if you're here listening to what I'm sharing right now, you're very fully, totally present in this moment. You're totally witnessing this moment. 
You're not allowing your thoughts, your mind, your energies, your attention to go anywhere else. Not in the past, not in the future, not in any imagination. You're fully present here. Developing this presence is what meditation is all about. Developing this constant presence. Developing this 100% awareness. Now, how do you do that? It's not a mental phenomena. It's a consciousness phenomena. How do we do that? At the level one, we start to become present in the body, about the body, which means what? You're sitting here. Are you fully attentive? Are you fully conscious? Are you fully aware of all the sensations that you're experiencing in the body? Right now, my hands are moving like this. Am I fully aware that the body part called hand has moved in a certain way right now? Am I present to this body's movement? Am I present to this body's sensation? I have a I have a twitch here. Am I present to this sensation right now? That's called presence in the body. Level two, presence of the mind. Is your mind fully present? Are you present about the things that are going in the mind? Are you fully present about the thoughts that are coming in your mind right now? The feelings that you're feeling? The emotions that you're experiencing in this moment? Are you fully present to that? Are you fully aware of that? That is developing meditation at the mind level. That sitting here, whatever is crossing in the, in the horizon of my mind, I'm aware of that. Because normally what happens, Deepa, we tend to lose this presence. Thoughts come, emotions come, and we, we lose this presence. We get totally, how do I say, uh, we get absorbed in that. A line of thoughts, thought is coming. I catch on to one thought and I get fully absorbed in that. And that thought takes me to another thought and another imagination journey starts. The presence goes. Right. Most of the time when you're doing, when you're thinking something very critical, you're not even aware of any sensation in the body. I meet people who feel like eating after every few hours. And I tell them, actually, you don't feel hungry at this moment. Your body is thirsty. So please drink water. So they are not even present to their body's sensation when the body is saying, I'm thirsty. I meet a lot of youngsters when they're playing their video game or they're on, on their phones or when they're working. They're most of the time their complaint is we forget to drink water, which means what? They lose the presence of the requirement of the body. They get absorbed in the task they are performing. They get absorbed in that, which means they get drowned in that. And they forget the body is asking for a sip of water right now. That's what meditation is all about. Can you be present 24 by 7? Right now, I've just talked about present in the body, present in the mind. As you develop this Deepa, you start to become present about the external environment also. Things that are happening around you become part of your presence, part of your consciousness. Nothing happens in your non-awareness. If you see most of the time, we keep something somewhere and we forget about it. And then we keep searching the whole house where I have kept my phone, where I, have, I kept my spectacles. We keep searching the whole house because we kept that object at that place unawarefully. We were not present in that action. Because we were not present in that action, mind was somewhere else, our attention was somewhere else, our consciousness was somewhere else. We forget. Where have we kept that thing? Do you follow this? So meditation is a, is a play of developing this presence. It is just not about 
sitting 30 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day with closed eyes and focusing on something, chanting a mantra while they are great tools to build this presence. Sitting every day in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, before you go to bed in the night, sitting silently, closing your eyes, and bringing this presence to your body's awareness, to your mental awareness, is a great tool. Chanting a mantra with fully being present there, not mechanically, is a great tool. Focusing your attention on your breath is a great tool. Because through all of this, slowly, you are generating and building this presence. Yeah. Now, once you start this process of building the presence with the closed eye meditation, you slowly start to expand it with the open eye meditation, which is what you asked. Now you start to bring this presence to every job, every task that you're doing. Which means you are very aware of the task that you're performing. You're witnessing the task that is getting performed through you. You're not getting absorbed, drowned in the task. You follow? Sometime, sometime when you eat your favorite food, let's say, there's a sense of indulgence in that food. You get drowned in that food and you lose the presence. Drowning in the process is losing the presence. So what is the way to eat that favorite food? You chew it by fully being present, experiencing every bite of it, every tatwa, every taste of it, every, every spice of it, you feel that, every flavor of it, you feel that. Because you're witnessing the process. You're not getting indulged into it. You have created a separation between the task and the performer. Do you follow? The task and the performer. And you're totally witnessing yourself eating and enjoying that food. That's how you develop this presence. Now you start to extend this presence to every task that you perform. For an example, I'm thirsty right now. I so it's a task. I pick up a cup. There's water in this. I'm witnessing myself. I'm watching this process. I'm fully present to this process of taking a sip of this warm water, even experiencing it the way it's going down the pipe and into my stomach. I'm a witness to this process. I'm not indulging to it. Through this presence, I've been able to watch this entire process. You can do this with every job that you're performing. You can extend this to every task in your day, 24 by 7. While it will not happen 24 by 7, because it will be very difficult at this stage to practice this during the sleep. Sleep is little beyond our control at this stage. <laughs> so don't say 24 by 7. Say that I want to and I start to develop this presence, stabilize this presence, strengthen this presence during my waking hours, throughout my waking consciousness. And as you start to do this during your waking hours, as you start to get stabilized during the waking hours, as this presence starts to get stabilized during the waking hours, then it will start to extend itself during the sleeping hours also yeah but don't focus on that right now right now develop this presence during the waking hours first so this is a whole process about developing maintaining sustaining this continuous presence and then you will see you will experience that it is not only 30 minutes in the morning when you close your eyes, you meditate. Your entire day starts to become meditative. You will feel that. It will start to energize you. And you will also see the task will stop uh, tiring you. You will not feel tired. Because we get tired when we get totally drowned. But when we are present, we don't get tired. Apply this principle. 
work with this and see the magic which it unfolds. Hope it helps. Thank you. Ji Swati. Thank you, Anishji. Our next question is by uh, Karanjeet. He's asking this from Amrit sir. He's saying, Namaskar ji, heard, read, and contemplated a lot about the truth that the whole of the universe is in you. It is an object of your awareness, me being that awareness itself. But still more clarity is needed on the topic. It is my sincere question for which I'm seeking answers and not merely intellectual curiosity. Kindly elaborate. Excellent. I'm so glad, uh, Taranji, that you mentioned that it's your sincere question and not just a intellectual curiosity, because that's what makes all the difference. Yes. So the key point here is, you said the whole of the universe is in you. It's an object of your awareness. You've heard this, but we need to go a little more deeper in that. Let's look at it carefully, Taranji. What is this world all about? Who we are? Let's look at this today carefully. This entire world that we've built around ourselves. With For the world, let's understand what we mean by the word called world. Here, the mention of the world is not the America or the India or all of that. The world that you experience the world that I experience because your world of your experience and my world of my experience are totally different we could be living in the same house we could be living in the same room but still the world of your experience and the world of my experience could be totally different so first thing when we say the whole of creation or the whole of cosmos or the whole of world it is your world we are talking about. That's the first understanding you must know. Now, this world that you and I experience, it's the creation of our own mind. Whatever our mind thinks or contemplates on, our energy starts to move into that direction. And that reality starts to manifest itself. And we start to experience that. Everything that you experience is the creation of your own mind. We're sitting in the lands of Buddha. We're sitting in the lands of Shiva. We're talking about profound Vedantic truth today. And profound Buddhist truth today. It's the same thing. The world that you experience is actually your own creation. How does it happen? Now, this world that you consider your world, which is your house, your family, your car, your children, your phone. You have attached yourness, I-ness to all of these components. And hence, you experience the ups and downs of your own created creation. It's your own little cosmos that you have created in the mind by attaching the sense of this is mine. This is my wife. This is my husband. You've attached this sense of minus to all these relationships, to all these objects. That is the reason. If anything happens in, in any other part of the world, if some people die in any other part of the world, it does not matter to you that much. It does not matter to you that. We hear those news day in, day out. It does not matter to, to you that much because it is not part of your world. But if anything happens to somebody who's loved one to you, who's part of your world, the world that your mind, your identification has created, you feel immense pain now if something bad happens to them. Or if something good happens to them, you feel immense happiness. Because something is happening to people who are part of your world. And who created these people in your world? Your own thought, your own imagination. 
your own association, your own identification with them. That this is my family, this is my wife. It's your extended identification. The ego, the I-ness extend this identification to that object or to that being. When you sleep at night, when you go into deep sleep at night, your mental outward functioning stops. And this association or this identification that this is my wife, this is my son, this is my house, all of that is gone. In that moment, you do not even know the person sleeping next to you. In that moment, you do not even identify at the place where you are sleeping. All identification gets dropped at that moment. Your world vanishes in that moment. Your created cosmos vanishes in that moment. Yes or no? And as you wake up in the morning, the mind gets activated again. The identification, the memory of the identification, remember, every identification is just a memory in the chitta. Chitta is the memory bank. If we just delete some of your neurons in your brain, if we delete some of these memories of associations or identification, you will stop identifying people of your own family as known people. You will feel that you do not know them. So these identifications are imprinted on your memory. So as you wake up in the morning, the mind gets activated. Memory of identification comes back. And this is my wife, I'm in my home, and all the world that your mind has created comes back to you. That's how this whole process happens. So if you look at it carefully, Taranji, this is the entire process of identification. What is it that you attach your consciousness with? We are all are conscious, we have consciousness, awareness this presence that I talked about. What is it that you attach your consciousness with? What is it that your consciousness start to identify with? That becomes your world. So, this is my wife. My consciousness start to identify with this person and term this person as my wife. My consciousness start to identify with this house that I'm living in. And I start to feel this is my house. I started, I meaning my consciousness has started identifying or attached with this place called house. And it becomes my house. The moment it becomes my house, the memory gets imprinted. The whole identification gets imprinted in the mind. Yeah. Now I've created my world like that. So whatever world you have created, whatever world you experience is the creation of your own identification. Just ex experiment with this. I call this my cup. My consciousness identified with this. Every day I drink my chai in this cup only. Yeah, It's my cup. Identified. I am identified. My consciousness is identified with this cup. How do we remove this? You start to remove your conscious identification from this cup. You still start to feel, believe, saying that it's a cup. That's all. The shape, the form is a cup. That is all. So if you see what Buddha did, we're sitting at the lands of Buddha. What actually Buddha did? He started removing his identification from any external object he started identif his he stopped ident the the identification with this is mine he started retracing that retracting from that so when he left home this is my wife this is my son this is my palace he started dropping that identification. He started dropping identification from his own body. 
that this is just a body. I am living in this body. He started dissolving his identification from his thoughts. Thoughts are coming, not my thoughts. They are purely thoughts emerging in my consciousness, not my thoughts. So he started retracting all the identification from the external objects to the body, to the mind. And he started containing this consciousness within himself, which I called presence before. He started containing this presence within himself, not allowing this presence to get identified with any object or any being outside. Because the moment identification happens, the ego will come into the play and say, this is mine, world is created. You follow this process. This is exactly how we create our own reality. If you identify with some events happening in the US, if you identify with them, the politics of the US, it will start to impact you. I meet a lot of people to whom politics of US is a big thing, to whom uh, 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 a soccer match between two European nations is a big thing. To somebody else sitting, they don't identify with those two nations or they don't identify with the football stars that they their teams have. The match does not matter to them. What's the difference? One person is excited about the match, other person is dispassionate about the match. What is the difference? First person has extended his conscious identification with those teams, with those stars not even of his own country, of some other nation. And hence, that match impacts him. The other person has not extended his identification with those teams, with those countries. Hence, whatever happens there does not matter to him. So person first, his world, he has created his own world, where the match of those two nations is very important. It impacts him. Person two, his world is limited. His identification is limited. Whatever is happening there does not matter to him. When I say does not matter to him means what? It only means that it is not part of his consciousness. He does not even know what's happening in that match. He's not identified with that. That's the whole game. So you will create the world of the things, of the beings, of the knowledge where you associate your identification with, where you create this association. So whole process of sadhana, meditation, is slowly becoming dispassionate about all of these associations, all of these identifications. So this cup is becomes just a cup and not my cup. This being who I call my husband or my wife, they are just being like me. They are also the manifestation of the divine consciousness like me, but not mine. I take care of them. I love them, respect them, I'm compassionate about them. I don't own them. So you start to withdraw this identification slowly. The day this withdrawal totally happens, the dispassion has totally happened, your presence is fully contained there, Paranji, that day, this whole cosmos will become your cosmos, the whole externalized cosmos also. Now your world will just not be localized, individual, self-created world. You follow? Now every Deva, every God, every being is part of your consciousness but not as ego. It's part of your chetna. Now something is happening in the US which is not good for beings. A deep prayer of compassion arises in your heart for them. A deep prayer that every being starts to live in this liberation. So we've seen the spider, the way spider builds the web and calls that web as his home. And the same spider can actually retrieve this whole web back into himself 
and dissolve this whole world that he created called my world, my home. Sadhana is just about that. Retrieve all these identifications. Understand that you are creating your world. Understand that you are creating your own living reality. Because you are creating your own living reality, you have the power to create any reality that you want. You can create the reality like the Buddha, who is not trapped, who is liberated, who is fully free, who is attained to moksha. You can create that reality. Or you can create the reality of somebody who is stuck, suffering in the web, in the loop of, in the circular loop of sansara, stuck in the circular loop of sansara because of his soul identification. So come back to your own consciousness. The witnesser that is always sitting inside you, watching the play. So from the actor, come to the director mode. Actor is the one who is doing, director is the one who is just guiding the process and watching the process. So we are all actually directors. We are not the actors. Action just happens through us. Contemplate on some of these things that I talked about, Taranji, and I'm sure it will give you a lot of clarity and a lot of understanding. Yeah. Hope it helps. Thank you. Ji Swati Ji. Gaurav from Gurgaon is asking this question. He's saying, I'm always afraid that my decisions might negatively impact the lives of many loved ones, of my loved ones. This fear binds me and stops me from experimenting with my ideas because my family is at stake. How can I overcome this? Or should I just accept these constraints and live with them? So Gaurav, just look at it. Buddha left his home. He put his family at stake. We justify that action. Why? Because he did that to attain the higher truth, to realize the higher truth of life. He did not put his family at stake for any personal desires or sense of fulfillment or sense of achievement. He did that for the attainment of the higher truth, for the attainment of the absolute jnana, knowledge of the structure of life. Are you also talking about that? When you're saying that you know you want to take some decisions, experiment with some ideas, but you think or you, you're concerned about your family's well-being, etc. Is your calling, are you doing that for the higher truth like Buddha? If that is so, you know the answer. But for most of us, that's not the reason. We have some small little ideas or thoughts about our own personal desires, our own personal notions. And we feel if we do that, you know, it might impact the families because it's somewhere deep down a very selfish desire. If that is so, am I condemning that? No, I'm not saying that. If that is so, since you are a householder, you entered into a householder process, the right way is please provide for the family, please take care of the family, whatever basic necessities that they must be provided for. Fulfill your responsibilities towards them. Set that part well, and then go and experiment with whatever new thoughts, ideas, experiments that you want to do so that your personal desires or your personal callings must not impact their well-being. That, that is what you must do. Ideal is, when you experiment with your own ideas, if you can take your family along, that's the best. If they become the party of it or part of it, if they join forces with you, even by saying that we agree, go ahead, do what you want to do. That's the best thing. 
So talk, communicate, share your heart out. Most of the time, we keep our things and feelings in our head. Share with your loved ones. That's the reason we call them loved ones. They listen to you. They care for you. Yes, they have some concerns, but talk, talk to them. Communication, conversation will ease out a lot of things. Yeah. And as I said, they have certain, uh, you have certain responsibilities towards them. You need to provide for that. Make sure you take care of that part well. Huh? Your uh, experiments huh, must not snatch or take away their the food from their table. Yeah. So this is a balancing act. A householder has to be a great balancer. Hmm? Householder is all about the perfect balance. Only then you can manage or or take care of the household well in a most harmonious way. So work on this balance. Yeah, I hope these two, three pointers that I've shared with you, they will help you. Hmm? Think about this. Thank you. Niswati. Subham Sharma ji from Guwahati is asking our next question. Pranam, what should be the approach of a spiritual seeker towards formal education, material education? As an individual progresses on the path of spirituality, it becomes challenges to, challenging to prioritize monetary gains as a goal for pursuing education. Does formal education have any role to play in one's spiritual journey? Okay. Yeah, interesting. Um, okay. So, Shubham, look at it this way. In India, we've looked at education in a very different way. Let's understand it very quickly. Yeah. We divided education into two parts in, in this country. One we call Paravidya. The other we called Aparavidya. And we said both these are important for life. What is Paravidya? Paravidya, we created which you call the formal education. That's come under Paravidya, which means the knowledge of this world, how maths work, how science works, um, you know, how sociology works, and all of that. That's Paravidya. That Vidya, that knowledge, that education is important to conduct your life in this physical reality. Yeah, so that is very important. If you don't have that, it will be very difficult for you to go out and earn a living. Yeah. Now comes the Aparavidya which is the vidya, the knowledge of not of this material world, but beyond this material world, beyond this material existence. There's another knowledge. You can call it Vedanta, let's say. That all comes under Aparavidya. How when you chant a mantra, it can impact the uh, neurons of your brain and make you much more focused and calmer and peaceful is part of the Aparavidya, yeah? which is uh, beyond this world, beyond this material existence. So two vidyas, of the material existence and of the non-material existence. Now, now, sorry, I, I just use the word opposite. Paravidya is of the other world. Aparavidya is of this world. Yeah, just make that uh, differentiation. Now, the formal education for a spiritual seeker is also very important because for a spiritual seeker, as I said earlier, his whole life is about balancing act. In this world today, in the today's reality, if you are a spiritual seeker, you still have to go out, earn a living, maintain a certain life. If you are a householder, provide for the family also. And for that, formal education is needed. Because this formal education will help you get some wealth. That wealth will help you follow the path of dharma or go towards your moksha. If I simplify it further, in India, we've talked about four principles. Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. First, understand what is the dharma, which is spiritual understanding. Then we said, go 
and earn your living artha very important to earn the wealth earn your living because without that you become dependent on others that's what not spiritual seeker is all about spiritual seeker must not be dependent on anybody self sufficiency is the rule here for that you need to go and earn your wealth karma fulfillment of desires even as a spiritual seeker you will have some bit of karma some bit of desires in you without the wealth you'll not be able to fulfill the the desires then you'll have to suppress the desires it will create a disease in you yeah so some level of dharmic desires must be fulfilled and with these three put together you start to walk towards the path of moksha so hence formal education has a certain role it will allow you to go out and earn your living and with that fulfill some of your desires and with that also make sure that you're able to follow the path rightly and not dependent on anybody else yeah that's a balancing act again shubham contemplate on that it's very essential yeah hope it helps thank you ji swati looking at the time we can take one one last question all right let's see. Nidhi from Delhi is asking this question. He's asking, does karma theory exist, or is it just a creation of man to keep man on the track? Yeah, it's actually quite a quick question, and I will give a very quick answer to that. See, in India, karma theory, we when our rishis created the karma theory, for us, it's not a philosophical mumbo jumbo. It's a real cause and effect process. If you want to understand this practically, go out on the street, just slap somebody, yeah, and in that moment you will see if the karma theory is real, does it work or if it does not work, yeah. Very simple, yeah, and that will give you the answer more than I speaking on it, yeah. You should sometimes do some practical experiments, and that gives you a lot of jnana. This satsang gives you a lot of jnana, but when you do some practical efforts on the street, that also gives you enormous jnana. Uh, so go out on the street, test it out, and you will see if cause and effect, which is the karma theory, does it work or does it not work? Yeah, or if it's just a man's creation. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> With that, I think uh, we've come to looking at the time. Yeah. <laughs>